Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Department of Energy, I am very excited to announce today a plan to convert the entire United States energy grid into one powered entirely by renewable sources. And we'll do it, ladies and gentlemen, in only slightly more time than it took to win World War II. The American Renewable Clean Energy Network, American, is part of President Obama's Climate Change Action Plan. It will put ownership of energy production directly in the hands of individuals, small entities, and entrepreneurs like yourselves. It will both subsidize large facilities and ensure that every American who wants to can put a solar panel on his or her roof. We will do this by taking the subsidies, the tax breaks that we give to oil companies to the tune of billions of dollars per year, and we will give them to individuals communities, and other small entities so that they can build healthy energy, sustainable energy, that will renew not only our energy future, but the entire planet. Hi, I'm Laura Flanders, and that was a gentleman identifying himself as Benedict Waterman, Under Secretary of Policy Implementation at the U.S. Department of Energy, speaking at the Homeland Security Congress in Washington this April. A plan to convert the United States energy grid entirely to renewables by 2030? Really? The lobbyists and contractors at the Congress didn't doubt it. In fact, they were thrilled, clapping and cheering. They joined Waterman and his colleagues from the Department of Interior and the Bureau of Indian Affairs hmm, in a circle dance of celebration of a fabricated American plan. Fabricated? You bet. The announcement was, in fact, nothing but another prank from the amazing culture jammers The Yes Men with Gitz Crazy Boy, an indigenous tar sands activist, in collaboration. Here to tell us more about it are Yes Men, Andy Bickelbaum and Mike Bonanno. Welcome, both of you. Hey, Laura. Thank you. Nice to, <laughs> nice to get this off. <laughs> I mean, where to begin? First, tell us what this Homeland Security Congress really is. It was just one of these conferences that people pay to attend to hear about government contracts often. So it's a bunch of contractors, defense or Homeland Security contractors, and others who stand to gain from public money being spent on things like Homeland Security. It's and kind of serious folks. Yeah, serious people that we usually think of as the dark side. And their reaction was pretty damn thrilled. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When you have a positive message that people know in their hearts is the right thing to do, chances are they're going to embrace it, even if they are defense contractors. I mean, these people have children, they have grandchildren, they care about the future, even though they're living with the status quo and they don't see an easy way out. But there are easy ways out, and that's the whole message. Well, that's yes, what thing. I was wondering. I mean, their acceptance of your proposal suggested it's it is in fact viable, is it? It's totally viable, completely. And the message for me of this, this whole thing is that we've got to lead. We, meaning millions of us, we can lead and make these things happen and force, for example, Obama or whoever is in office to actually implement things that are sane and are possible and everybody will follow except a few oil company executives. So how did you set this thing up? People want to know. A, how do you ever get into these conferences? Because this isn't the first time you've done a prank like this. And B, how do you get out? Hmm. <laughs> well, to set it up, we pretended to be from a major PR firm called Burson Mars Teller. These are nasty guys. They were behind the smoking is good for you campaigns, you know, <laughs> that have since been uh, debunked, in case you didn't hear that. Um, also, a lot of climate denial stuff work yep, they do. Yeah, so right a now. Real firm. Yeah, real this firm. is a real giant PR firm that does really nasty things, and we just said, you know, pretended to be from them, uh, emailed the conference organizers, and said that we represented Colin Powell, who wanted to speak at their weird Homeland Security Congress. And of course, a conference like that is thrilled to have somebody like Colin Powell arriving at their event. And so they were very excited, and then um, over time, you know, we just sort of kept telling them that Powell was going to arrive, and they were thrilled until the day before the conference. Mm. And we were driving up in a car to Washington, D.C., down, I guess, from New York, and Mike got a call on his cell phone, his special Google Voice Skype setup cell phone, 
from the conference organizer who'd been trying to reach him all morning and couldn't and she was about to fly to the conference. She couldn't reach him and, and she just sounded really suspicious because she had just called the company. And then we very shortly afterwards got a call from the company, from Burson Marsteller in DC, who had received the call from the conference organizer and they totally got that we were impersonating them and they were furious. Um, so we thought it was all over and we started making a plan B and freaking out and being depressed and all these things. We were absolutely 100% certain that it was over. But it turned out that the conference people just kept acting as if nothing had happened really. They were only a bit suspicious and then it all passed. Bursa Marsteller never called them back to tell them that we were fake. So we were very lucky and we got to carry it off. And out of the building you walked after having led these contractors and lobbyists on a circle dance <laughs> to a not all that persuasive native tune. I don't think it was that persuasive. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> I, you know, Gitz, who unfortunately isn't here for the interview, crazy had boy. said, Gitz crazy boy, yeah, he had said, you know, we can, I think I can make them do anything because, you know, there'll be so much deference for the Native American in the room that I could lead them on any kind of um, strange ritual. And sure enough, he was right. Yeah. They, they went with it. They rolled with it. And Tito Ibarra, who's the comedian who's playing the drum, is actually a, a brilliant singer. And one of the things you don't see in that video is that he begins the event with a prayer that's quite reverent and is actually kind of a traditional song. And people uh, really buy into it because it sounds so good, you know, mm -hmm. and so I think they, that proved the authenticity, yeah. even though they were playing caricatures. terribly touching about people going with the flow as you said you speak to something in them that wants to believe mm -hmm. right Absolutely. is that what makes a really great culture jam well it's one of the things it echoes what we all want and what we all know is possible like we can do this and we have to do this and even those people are fine with it even those people can get up and dance enthusiastically about it let alone the rest of us all we have to do is just make it happen it's a tall order but we can do it so how do you get away with it? I mean, you got out of there, as far as I could see, not in handcuffs or anything. No, they still thought we were, uh, they were still waiting for Colin Powell when we left. And they kept calling all afternoon. Um, and we just didn't have the heart to tell them. There was no real reason, but we didn't have the heart to tell them that he wasn't coming. So finally. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid that most of them <laughs> believed it until at least the end of the day, and some of them may still believe it. When it comes to the kind of work that you do, what's been the most remarkable aspect of it? I mean, you've now pulled this prank at the Homeland Security folks around renewables. You pulled pranks after the Hurricane Katrina around what's it going to take to protect people. We'll do it individually. Uh, you've done no, no end of these. What have you learned about what makes a really great culture jam? Mm. Well, I mean, first of all, there's two kinds of things we do. One is you know, dark satire in the tradition of Jonathan Swift, like a modest proposal, you know, where he suggested that the Irish solve the hunger problem by eating their babies, you know, acting against the British policy at that time that was starving the Irish, even though there was food. Um, there. So th that kind of dark humor is something that we often indulge. But then I think the most revealing thing for us has been to use those moments of power when people think that we're somebody powerful to announce a utopian vision for the world that it turns out even our adversaries or people we imagine to be our adversaries can buy into simply because they see the common sense and the idea. Something like converting to renewables now is so sane compared to what we're doing, which is risking the future of the entire planet. And it is the only planet we have, I think, still. <laughs> and so when presented with that sane vision of what we could be doing, they're ready to embrace it, no matter what their politics are. 
And yeah. these, were, these were contractors. So one thing that happened that I think you'll see is they came up on mass afterwards and gave me their business cards. And you and Gitz, they were just, I want to help. I'll do this. And that, you know, they had different, like some of them were defense contractors. Some of them were, you know, dealt with electrical systems for aircraft or whatever, what have you. And they wanted to help with renewable energy stuff. And I think that's also a really important message is that we all have a way to, to help, even those of us who have gone into building, you know, aircraft. Um, everybody can help in some way to build a better future. So how do you explain the U.S. foot dragging on this? I mean, I was just in Appalachia. I was just in North Dakota. In both places, you're seeing a push not to renewables in face of the decline of the industry of coal, but rather to fracking oil and gas, to natural gas uh, drilling of different kinds. Why are we so behind as a country on this renewable push? We're so behind on the renewable push because democracy is broken. The oil companies and the lobbyists are ruling our decision-making processes, and we need to take them out. I mean, right now, what we're doing makes no sense. Fracking, you know, to get the last drops of oil and gas uh, is crazy because it risks our water supply. Why would we want to do that? Why would we want to risk earthquakes? Why would we do all that when we have energy from the sun? We've got energy from the wind. We know how to harness it. It's completely bonkers. And the only explanation for it is that the oil companies have a stranglehold on government. The oil companies have trillions of dollars of assets locked in the ground. And they have to get that out or their stock value will completely collapse. So as long as we're allowing ourselves to be ruled by a system that's a market for stocks and for oil that's underground, we're gonna be screwed like this. As long as we let them do whatever they want in the pursuit of profit, which we do, and corrupt our system through lobbying and um, so on and so forth, we're gonna be screwed. So the, there are solutions and they're easy. Um, and some of them, we can even just look across the ocean and see a better way of doing things, taxing the wealthiest. We've got to do that. We've got to have a tax on the wealthiest for the common good. We've got to tax financial speculations, just obvious things that aren't hard to implement unless you have oil companies that control the whole thing. So the first step is getting them to not control things. Maybe eliminating lobbying would be a good first step. I don't know, a constitutional amendment to that. I mean, these are not small tasks, but we can do them and we have to. One of the things we're seeing around the country and we've covered here on the program is the divestment campaign on campuses, which scored a big victory mm -hmm. this spring at Stanford, where the Board of Trustees were persuaded, in fact, to divest from fossil fuels. Um, do you think that's part of a momentum building? And what difference will divestment by colleges really make? Yeah, divestment is as a massive movement now there's so many students who are working towards that and it's a step that makes sense divestment played a role uh in the the movement to end apartheid in south africa it's going to play a role in this movement it's a small part of a massive movement though and it's an important part but it it one of the first steps is getting the money yeah. out of these companies and it's critical because colleges it's not a huge chunk of the national money like, it all has to get out, not just college money. But it's a place where um, this moral decision can be made and set an example for everybody. And that's really the duty of students right now, is to do that. They've got to lead all of us. And it often happens in history that, that those are the people who lead us. Um, and they've got to step up and do that right now. So finally, just talk, in character or not, to <laughs> some of the people out there. I mean, I've got in my mind former coal miners in eastern Kentucky who think that mountaintop removal is the only thing standing between them and in total impoverishment and mm. the loss of their culture, or to the Native Americans residing on the reservations in North Dakota who are seeing more money coming in from oil drilling than they've seen in generations. Um, what do you say to them? Are you taking money and food out of their families? Well. The system that we've got now that's based on fossil fuels is all about extracting resources as cheaply as possible and leaving people with nothing, right? And we're talking about taking a longer term view. And one of the nice things about thinking about conversion to 
to alternative energy is that you can also address social justice problems, systemic social justice problems. And one of the parts of the proposal that we made, or not the proposal, but the fait accompli, this new policy that was announced. American. American <laughs> was that Americans will actually own the energy infrastructure. So this new energy can be owned by the people. And it is a resource. It's kind of like thinking we need water to drink. If, if energy is what it takes to run our civilization, it should be our right as well. And we should own that energy. So that is the, the difference. Right now it's used to enslave and, and oppress people. And it could liberate people. It could be something that enhances everybody's autonomy and freedom, actually freedom. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's true that the people who are there are in a really tough spot. They're in a devastated place and they're stuck with this in a lot of ways because it's, you know, maybe for some of them it's too late even. I don't know. It's up to us, though, all of us, everybody else, to make sure that those lies don't get across. Like the lie that the Keystone XL pipeline will provide jobs. It's an easy lie to see through the number of permanent jobs it'll provide versus how many jobs renewable energy would provide and what kind of jobs those would be. Um, those kind of things, it's up to us really to, to make sure that those things get across and that interests that want to destroy our world and our lives can't do so. Is Benedict Waterman the character that you played modeled on anyone in particular? Is there a Benedict <laughs> Waterman in office in Washington DC somewhere just waiting to come out? Well. I think he's modeled on any of us who want a better world and what we would do in there. It's like the, the Department of Energy, we're kind of the Department of Energy is the, the message that it's our energy that has to change things. Um, the, the way he looked actually was modeled on the actual head of the Department of Energy, one Ernest Moniz, who has a head of hair very similar to this sort of. Oh, so apologies to him? <laughs> apologies to Mr. Moniz. Did Moniz's. you hear from him? No, not yet. And has anyone from government reached out to you? They haven't reached out to us. One of the people who was in the audience reached out and said, I love this, this is great. I mean, he had searched for it afterward because he thought something's wrong here. Uh, and, and so he found a, a clip online and was very excited. I think, though, that a lot of the people in government, particularly in the Department of Energy, you know, other departments like this, they get into, that, into those positions because they want to change things for the better. They're there to try to make it better. And they have a lot of frustration when they're blocked. When, they, when you say, for example, you can't just invest everything in alternative energy, they get frustrated too. So I think they're probably pretty happy mm -hmm. about the new policy. Anything people can do if they want to say yes to the yes man? Well, yeah. In, we were so inspired by this action that we actually created a platform called the Action Switchboard where people can come and propose ideas that they want to do and get help carrying them out, get advice, get feedback, and get hooked up to other people who want to do things. So we've enjoyed doing this, and we want other people to do it. So we've set up this platform. You can find more about the new policy at our website. Thanks so much for coming in. Thank Andy you. Bickerbaum, Mike Bonanno, appreciate it. Thank you. We'll look out for the next Yes Man prank any day now. This is the Reed College commencement of 2014, and I am the commencement speaker. I'm going to announce that Reed College is divesting from fossil fuels. The Board of Trustees decided just last week that they were not divesting from fossil fuels. So this is going to be a complete shock to the president, to them, and uh, we'll see how it goes. I'm a little nervous. And an industry of naysayers is generated people's job it is to make us think that we cannot change this system or that it's not worth it, whatever that means, <laughs> or that it's futile, or that it will be too expensive. Bullshit! <laughs> Those same arguments were used over a century ago to validate slavery in the United States. The economy would collapse without it, people said. I'm pretty sure that we made the right choice when we outlawed slavery. This morning, I had breakfast with President Kroger, 
and over a scone and a cup of coffee, I was very pleased to learn that the Board of Trustees of Reed College has just now decided to divest the school's $500 million endowment. <laughs> Flanders. In early February, I tore a tendon in my knee. Painful but fixable once I decided to actually do something about it. The shocker about knee surgery, it turns out, isn't the surgery, it's the preparation in advance and the recovery afterwards. Right after the knee drama, I was on the road in Kentucky for a story about coal and then in North Dakota for my first look at the back and oil boom. You could say I've been on a slightly limping tour of the fossil fuel economy, complete with physical therapy and ice packs. What did I learn about knees? Well, get them in good shape before you operate and they'll recover pretty well. I'll take a little trauma over an injury that's just going to weaken the whole system. As for the economy, we're certainly limping. The beautiful mountains of Kentucky are looking pretty battered from mining, and the same could be said of the rolling plains of North Dakota. They're dotted with drilling rigs, hundreds of them, pecking away at the landscape. Environmentalists aren't wrong to urge us to break with fossil fuels. There's no question we're weakening the system with our bad habits. Surgery is probably required. Still, it seems to me there's very little chance of fixing the environment if, like the knee, we don't first strengthen the body politic. No one ever loved the extraction economy, but the same industry that poisoned the water did put food on the table. Before we push people into surgery, how about spending that 100 million to strengthen the muscles of an alternative? Up north, the back and oil fields just produced their billionth barrel of oil, 80% of it from North Dakota. Alongside the drilling, there's the flaring. Millions of cubic feet of natural gas are burned off into the atmosphere day and night. People are concerned about the price they're paying, but it's hard to deny the profits to people who've already endured more than their fair share of damage. Of the back and shale, the richest deposits of oil seem to fall beneath tribal land, belonging to three Native American tribes who lost 150,000 acres of their most fertile fields in a flood when the Army Corps of Engineers chose right there to dam the Missouri River. Environmental trauma is not only on its way, it's already here. But there will be no environmental repair without a whole lot of political rehabilitation. In the meantime, me, I'm back home in a city that burns up a whole lot of fuel, and I'm not changing my habits. Without refrigeration, after all, where would I get those ice packs? Gain without pain, as the physical trainers say. It's our favorite delusion. For more on the back and oil situation, keep watching this program. And write to me, laura at grittv.org. Thanks. <laughs> 